When you think of female rulers of Egypt, obviously the first person who comes to mind is Cleopatra, the lovely last pharaoh of Egypt, who is portrayed by William Shakespeare and some parts of contemporary popular culture to be a beautiful master seductress who managed to charm the pants off of any Roman guy who came her way. Not only is this interpretation hilariously out of touch, but we should also shed some light on the fact that she wasn't the only female ruler of ancient Egypt. For today, we delve into the reign of Pharaoh Hatshepsut, Egypt's first female ruler. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening ladies and gents around the world and welcome back to a history of humanity as part of the Grand Portfolio. So last time we left off, Tuthmosis 1 and 2 told their neighbours to shoo and made their population say woohoo. But what's next? Well, it's 1479 BC and Tuthmosis II has just snuffed it. But what's next for the line of succession? Well, Tuthmosis III, Tuthmosis II's son, would have been up next, but with him not being of age yet, Hatshepsut, one of the wives of Tuthmosis II and Tuthmosis II's half-sister, right? Oh, so that must be who the Habsburgs took notes off of. It all makes sense now! What is this, is history on a rerun or something? Before her ascension as regent of the throne, however, Hatshepsut held the honour known as God's Wife of Amun. This position has been noted as far back as the Middle Kingdom of Egypt, and was an honorary title for women of the upper class, the title usually being held by a ruler's wife or daughter, and would involve the said upper-class individual assisting the high priest of Amun in their duties at the great temple of Amun at the temple site at Karnak. However, by the time of the New Kingdom, the position of God's wife of Amun would make a woman of the upper class powerful enough to dictate policy in Egypt. So even before her reign began, Hatshepsut held a position of high prestige and authority in ancient Egyptian society, making her powerful enough to even dictate policy alongside the pharaoh himself. Meaning that by the time of her husband's death in 1479 BC, Hatshepsut already held considerable power within the Egyptian government, so much so that it has even been found that as early as 1485 BC, six years before her reign as pharaoh began, Hatshepsut was already being depicted as a male pharaoh, meaning that she was already being viewed as a great leader even before the death of Tuthmosis II, and her status as God's wife of Amun only reinforced this because in this position, she would have been expected to preside over festivals dedicated to the god Amun, who at the time in the New Kingdom of Egypt was beginning to be seen as a creator god under the guise Amun-Ra, of which you've probably heard of. So like those who already held the position of pharaoh, such as Tuthmosis II, Hatshepsut was already considered a divine being amongst the mere mortals of Egypt. So when Tuthmosis II did kick the bucket in 1479 BC, it must have been an absolute breeze for her to just walk in and take the throne with nobody raising even a finger. Because don't forget, at the time, Tuthmosis III, Hatshepsut's son, was still considered too young to rule at this time. So for Hatshepsut, taking the throne of Egypt, piece of cake. And with her ascension to the throne now covered, let's delve further into the events of her reign. Even when she had just begun to get comfortable on the throne, Hatshepsut recognised that she was in uncharted waters as far as the monarchy was concerned. For you see, she recognised that she was the first female ruler in an Egypt where so far there had only been male rulers, kings and pharaohs. And realising this, she quickly went to work legitimising her reign and securing it, even still referring to her son, Tuthmosis III, as the real king, 
Although, at this time, Tuthmosis III more or less was only king in name only. And not stopping at this, she married her daughter Neferu Ra to her son Tuthmosis III and named her as the new god's wife of Amun, therefore gifting her a position in government with great power and prestige. So even if Tuthmosis III suddenly threw his toys out the pram and began asserting his claim to the throne, Hatshepsut would still be in a position of great power as the mother of the king and also of the new god's wife of Amun, meaning that she, despite the possibility of losing the throne to Tuthmosis III, would still be in a position to enact great power and policy change over Egypt if need be. But aside from this, however, Hatshepsut also began commissioning statuary of herself portrayed in male garb which according to the historians Breer and Hobbes, may not have been to trick the Egyptian people into thinking that she was a man, but instead to convince her people that she had as much a right to rule over Egypt, as much divinity as any male pharaoh who had come before her. And at that I've gotta say, damn Hatshepsut, you tell those haters. So if Hatshepsut can legitimise her reign in such a variety of concrete ways, then you, my friend, you can ace that exam, you can smash that job interview, and you can certainly finish that takeaway you've just ordered. An inspiration aside, perhaps the most interesting way in which Hatshepsut legitimised her reign was by reminding the Egyptian people of her lineage, of her descent from the king who at the time was still quoted as an Egyptian hero, Armose I, you know, the one who expelled the Hyksos. And Hatshepsut even took it a step further, attributing herself to the expulsion of the Hyksos as one of her inscriptions reads, quote, I have restored what was destroyed. I have raised what had been shattered, since the Asiatics were in the delta at Avaris, when the nomads among them were overturning what had been made. They ruled without the god Ra, and did not act with divine decree, right down to my majesty's time, close quote. And after all that info about Hatshepsut legitimising her reign, it seems her position as pharaoh was possibly as secure as Switzerland's position as a neutral country in today's world. So with her position being secure and legitimised, let's move on to Hatshepsut's dealings with foreign policy. Now, you'll probably remember how in the last video I said that Tuthmosis I managed to finally suppress the Nubians into submission. However, the same can't be said for the more northern expansive territories of Egypt. At this time, yes, Egypt had a strong hand to the south in Nubia. However, things weren't as secure up in the north in the Levant, Palestine and Syria. There wasn't a strong enough foothold there yet which means putting down rebellions up in the Northern Territories was a constant job for the pharaohs of Egypt in Hatshepsut's time. And so a military campaign was undertaken into the Levant and Syria in order to quell any dissent and rebellions and to reinforce Egypt's position as the dominant power over the area. A military campaign was also undertaken into Nubia to the south. However, this was more or less just to make sure that everything was definitely secure down there. And if I'm being honest, it was. Egypt had a lovely deck of cards down in the south, so much so that we now come on to the most important part of Hatshepsut's foreign policy, for her reign is famous for its official trade mission to the land of Punt, to the far south of Egypt, a place which, as you'll remember from my video on the Middle Kingdom, was a land rich in frankincense and myrrh, which throughout the time of the New Kingdom, Egypt would have very strong relations with, particularly in trade. And in order to lead a successful official trade mission far to the south of Egypt's territory, near the Horn of Africa of all places, Egypt's hold and territory in the south would have had to have been immensely strong, so as to not disrupt the functioning of trade routes towards that area. And was the trade mission a success, you ask? 
Well, by all accounts, yes it was. For according to the records we have, the Puntite trade mission was successful in bringing back a bounty of luxurious goods. So much so, that fresh myrrh trees were brought back from the land of Punt and planted in a courtyard that was to be part of Hatshepsut's mortuary complex, the complex of which still stands to this day, and is one of the most impressive structures of ancient Egypt's time. It is said to have been decorated by a beautiful courtyard, full of myrrh trees from the land of Punt, and adorned with large pools of water, giving a very peaceful effect to the complex itself. And inscriptions found within Hatshepsut's tomb go into further detail on how successful the Puntite trade mission truly was. Quote, the loading of the ships very heavily with marvels of the country of Punt, all goodly fragrant woods of the god's land, heaps of myrrh resin with fresh myrrh trees, with ebony and pure ivory, with green gold of emu, with cinnamon wood, with kesset wood, with imut incense, saunter incense, eye cosmetics, with apes, monkeys, and dogs, and with the skins of the southern panther. Never was brought the like of this for any king there had been since the beginning." Close quote. Such a rich bounty of trade goods now flowing into Egypt, the wealth of the country under Hatshepsut's reign was undeniable, with exotic woods, spices, metals, and minerals now flowing into the land, via trade relations with far lands such as Punt. It seems that Egypt had never been wealthier, truly the height of this ancient civilization. The immense wealth and prosperity that flowed and flourished throughout Egypt under Hatshepsut's reign is reflected in the building works and projects that were undertaken under her leadership. As part of an apparent tradition for all pharaohs of the new kingdom of Egypt, Hatshepsut constructed her own additions to the temple complex at Karnak, dedicated to the god Amun. And seeing as Hatshepsut had, before becoming pharaoh, been appointed to the high position of god's wife of Amun, it was perhaps seen as all the more important to build another addition to the temple at Karnak under her own name. This is where where that bounty of luxury goods and resources comes in handy, as Hatshepsut's addition to the temple at Karnak includes two great obelisks, and these structures in particular are perhaps the greatest testament to the endurance of ancient Egypt throughout history and across the world, with the Assyrians, Romans, and even the Byzantines building obelisks in their magnificent cities. And even in the United States, in Washington DC, don't look now, but what exactly does the Washington Monument look like? It only goes to show that through the efforts of Hatshepsut's constructions amongst other pharaohs, these grand architectural wonders ensured that Egypt would continue to live on in some shape or form be it as simple as a massive obelisk in Washington DC, or as great as entire museums, exhibitions, and elements of popular culture in today's world. But as for Hatshepsut's other building projects, she did not stop simply with her addition to the temple at Karnak, for in the region known as Deir el-Bari sits the grand architectural giant that is the mortuary complex of Hatshepsut, which is perhaps the greatest testament to the wealth, prosperity, stability, and far-reaching power of Hatshepsut's reign. Upon first construction, the mortuary complex had a garden-like courtyard filled with fresh myrrh trees imported from the land of Punt and decorated with small pools of water. Interestingly about the myrrh trees, however, their stumps, it appears, have been fossilised and can still be seen around the temple complex to this day. And a magnificent structure such as this said to have been so impressive that successive pharaohs 
of the New Kingdom chose to be buried near Hatshepsut's mortuary complex, which is perhaps why we have the area today known as the Valley of the Kings, where so many pharaohs of ancient Egypt are buried in one place. The mortuary complex itself, however, was built not only to mirror the grandeur and impressiveness that Hatshepsut's reign brought to the region, but is also adorned with artwork depicting the life and achievements of Hatshepsut. In addition to this, the mortuary complex of Hatshepsut also includes two temples to two distinct gods of Egypt, one being Anubis, guardian and guide of the dead in the afterlife, and also Hathor, a popular Egyptian goddess in the New Kingdom, who was said to be the protector of women, as well as being the goddess of the sky, love, and fertility. A goddess of which Hatshepsut was said to have invoked many times throughout her reign to justify her actions. Meaning that with the additions of these temples to her mortuary complex, it meant that Hatshepsut was completely protected throughout the afterlife, meaning that from securing her reign to foreign policy, to trade, to even death and the afterlife, Hatshepsut made sure that all of her ends were covered. And besides being nothing more than a massive testament to her achievements, accomplishments, and life in general, I must say that the mortuary complex of Hatshepsut is a marvel of architecture. For when researching this place, I came across something that is just nuts in how advanced it is for such an early civilization as ancient Egypt. For those of you who studied geometry in the States, for example, and found it incredibly boring, you may want to cover your ears now. Okay, so with those who don't find geometry interesting uh, taken care of, in one of the main chapels of the mortuary complex of Hatshepsut, it has been found that on the winter solstice every year, the temple is aligned so precisely that when the sun shines through an opening in the room, the sunlight filters down and shines on one of the statues of Osiris, flanking the entrance to the chapel. And this phenomenon has been found to have occurred every winter solstice day, every 21st of December, for around three and a half thousand years, and will still continue to do so, so long as the uh, circumstances don't change, that is. And the fact that this phenomenon can occur every single year at the mortuary complex of Hatshepsut is just incredible. It is mind-blowing that the Egyptians had such a knowledge of architecture and geometry to allow this phenomenon to happen. And to finish off about this building, there appears to be, around the site, many reliefs depicting one certain man in the company of Hatshepsut. This individual is known as Senenmut, who was said to be the architect of this building and one of the chief advisors to Hatshepsut in her court. He is even depicted holding Hatshepsut's young daughter, Neferu Ra. It has therefore been suggested by some modern scholars that there was perhaps some form of close relationship between the pharaoh Hatshepsut and Senenmut. However, for now, this is just a theory. And hey, look, we've probably got the first instance in history of tabloid journalism, and not the last. But despite being immortalised in all possible ways, even someone as impressive as Hatshepsut as an ending to her story. And so let's move on to the final days and the eventual passing of Pharaoh Hatshepsut. The date of Hatshepsut's death is yet unknown, all we know is that she disappears from the Egyptian historical records circa 1457 BC. During this time, during her reign, her son Tuthmosis III had not been sitting idly by. Hatshepsut gave him command of the army. 
However, when Hatshepsut did eventually pass away, it is said that Tuthmosis III ascended the throne and eventually ordered the destruction of any records or evidence of the existence of Hatshepsut's time on the throne of Egypt, and she disappeared from history almost entirely until she was finally rediscovered by the way of multiple expeditions and excavations in Egypt itself. And so today we have this wealth of information on perhaps one of the greatest rulers of ancient Egypt and possibly even the ancient world itself. She achieved so much during her reign that her accomplishments cannot simply be brushed off or discredited as Tuthmosis III tried to do and failed. Nice try kid, but you're not getting rid of her that easily. So there you have it. We now know that besides Cleopatra, in ancient Egypt, there was another great and impressive female ruler who would lead Egypt further down the path of its golden age and its greatest heights. I'm Lewis of The Grand Portfolio, and thank you for watching.